Hello, everybody, and welcome to CFO for Bordeaux. My name is Hannah Monroe, and today I'm talking with Chris Lloyd Mostyn all about his his project, driving transformation at the BT Group. So, welcome, Chris. Great to have you on the show. Hi, great to be here. Great to meet you. So, tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris. Like, how did you end up at the BT Group, and what was your background before you came into this project? So, I was in BT Group for for 19 years in total and doing a number of different roles in finance. I, I actually started in the commercial team, so I was supporting the bid finance and then moved into sort of central roles. So I was actually running the group planning process in BT, so that was the 20 billion pound turnover, putting the balance sheets, cash flow forecast, so that was a fantastic central role. And this was about 10 years ago, the uh, finance director came up to me and said, um, how do you fancy building the design for a new transformation for the planning area in, in BT? So they were just about to kick off a finance transformation program. And that was split up into about sort of eight different areas within the process. You'd have sort of a level one, level two process. So there was one that was covering the whole end-to-end -end planning function. So I moved in, took that role and essentially built a a design for BT to build. So that was my my remit over a number of years. So that role then evolved and I moved into a more central program role in finance transformation. So I was responsible for the governance, assurance, the scope management and that side of things. So it's slightly different from the what I call a global process owner. It was more of a central sort of management role. And then we sort of took a bit of a sort of pivot turn in the program about five years ago, where we'd done all our design, we'd, we'd sort of understood what our as-is position was, but we realized cloud computing was taking over and our previous approach of doing an on-premise solution was just out of date and not the way forward. So we almost like sort of started again and had a reset of the program. And so my job was to put the business case together to justify how we could put a case together to the board to say, let's make a huge investment and bigger step change moving cloud computing. So that's really my and story of how I've got to, to where I am. And that, that's, there's so much in that I want to explore with you, Chris. So just talk to me about kind of where was BT at in their discovery process when you came into the team? Like, did they already have an, a rough idea of what they wanted this transformation piece to look like and deliver? Or was it very much a, we know we need to do transformation, but we don't know where to start? It was certainly the latter. And so didn't have an idea of really soft, what software to go with, didn't have an idea of, didn't understand the current processes existing. All, all we knew in BT was that we had about 150 mainly old systems running the whole of our end-to-end -end finance that weren't talking to each other or talking to each other properly. A lot of them were either out of date, out of service, and they might be critical systems. So we knew we had a, prob a big problem we had to address and as soon as we could, otherwise there were some big exposures in our, in our finances. Wow, 150 systems that you, and how many did you end up consolidating to out of interest? We consolidated probably, I'd say at least half of them. I mean, obviously they vary in size massively, but that was one of our things was, was just closing down the complexity of all our legacy systems. And how did you go? Because obviously 150 systems and, you know, deciding on which systems to prioritize, you know, how did you actually approach sort of the, the scale and the scope of that project in those planning phases? Well, one thing we did is that we mapped out what, what what are those 150 systems? That was hard enough, just actually identifying what ones are actually driving finance processes. And once we'd done that, then it was going through system by system and, and understanding the level of criticality to deliver our financials and then understanding the level of service behind them. So is it, you know, as we've got a contract, it's 10 years and we're absolutely fine, or is it something which, um, no kidding, we're going to ha we're having to go on to eBay to find bits to to hold up bits of systems together. I mean, it was, you know, completely unsupported, 
and sort of begging suppliers to do things for us. So it was everything in between. And I think sometimes that that's that the risk element of finance transformation often gets forgotten or not focused on. We're always focused about the productivity and the time mm. savings, but there's real value, isn't there, in actually just the the change in terms of minimizing the risk to the business. Yeah, yeah. And I think from from our perspective, that was the single biggest driver and the single biggest benefit. So although we we end up building a case which had a positive NPV. On, on tangible cash flows, the biggest benefit was the softer, intangible, reducing risks of, of you know, a, a data breach, um, not being able to produce our accounts at the end of the year, fraud, um, you know, there were, there were just so many big risks that we just knew we had to address. So let's talk about that sort of that business case piece. Talk, how did you actually approach decide, you know, putting together the business case? Because some of that sounds like and and I, and I use the word like really common sense, like you guys are massively exposed as a, as a business by, by having all of these systems. But how did you actually put and um, sort of decide on that business case and what should be presented? So the two main elements, as I mentioned around, there's a lot about the risk reduction. So it's how do we um, explain that to the BT board, ultimately, who are going to kind of approve this and how do we sort of quantify it and make it real? So that was one thing. And then there was the the, 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 the financial benefits. So where are we going to actually get our check back? So there are the two areas now treated quite separately. So if I talk about the sort of the risk reduction bit, it was, some of it was like, what KPIs can we put in place to measure? So for example, um, our percentage of automated controls, we had very manual controls before. So it was saying like, what well, if we're, uh, I don't know, 90% manual, can we get to 50% and 50% and, and automated? So it was, it, was, it was having KPIs, it was creating heat maps for things like the systems. So our rationalization of the 150 systems, can we have a heat map showing it was all red, really, all unsupported, all critical, you know, can we get that green? It was, um, well, one thing I did put together, which was looking at sort of scenarios. So it was a bit like, um, you know, BT a few years ago had a uh, a fraud uh, issue, and that that was obviously widely in the public uh, domain. Came out in the press, etc. And the share price th- lost something like four billion pounds of market capitalization afterwards. So we could put these sort of scenarios against these circumstances. If you had a fraud claim, the risk of fraud might be ten percent now, but if we can get it to three percent. If we can, if, if on, a, on a four billion impact, that's quite sizable. So we won't put that in a cash flow, but we can give some sort of bring it to life a little bit on what we can we can deliver. And in terms of those, because that's really interesting in terms of sort of bringing it to life. Like, what other scenarios did you have for the different risks that help them help the board understand the you know the value of the risk, as it were? So, so, so the other risks were things like management information. So the risk is that you make poor decisions because you, you don't have the right MI. So we, we put scenarios. So for example, if you have better MI, could you improve your margin by X percent? Could you make more optimal pricing decisions because you have better information of your costs end to end in the business? Or, um, you know, do, do you know, are you making suboptimal investments across the business? We spent four billion pounds of capex a, a year in BT, and you know, is that spend optimally? Do you have a better review of your return on each of those assets than you can spend and allocate your capital better? So, you know, the little one percent here and there on billions and pounds money actually makes a big impact. So, it's trying to bring that to life of the sort of areas that you could actually generate those benefits. No, that's great. And 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 so you mentioned obviously um you've you've put all of those scenarios together and, and it sounds like you also have objectives as well that came out of those. You mentioned the heat maps and reducing, you know, reducing the, the reds to greens by a certain percentage. So at that stage were you actually putting together goals and objectives for how you're gonna measure the reduction in risk as well? Yes, totally. So um and that that's hard, you know, 
it's, it's easier the, the numbers bit where it's head counts and things that's the easy bit that so measuring risk was well probably the heat map's easier because we could say look we want to reduce our our systems by 50 percent and our critical systems um need our unsupported systems from i don't know 80 percent to 20 percent or something so we can have clear targets I think it was harder when we looked at the scenarios on things like risk of fraud or risk of data breach, because if you didn't have that and didn't occur, they didn't, you might only get one of those every 10 years. So how do you measure it? So it was a lot more sort of reassessment. And actually what I did do is we had a, in VT, we have a group, a group risk team, which oversee big risks across the group um, uh, in, in all areas. So it was trying to align with that. So everything that I did is putting together a risk assessment would be backed off and aligned with, as a group under the group risks. So we'd actually see not just what we're doing in this program, but how that impacts our overall group risks and, and, and to do a reassessment every, every few years on where we think we are on that risk scale and how, is that progressing or not? But it was a judgment. It's not an exact science as you can probably imagine. No, and, and what was the board's reaction to the way that you presented? Like, it, you know, looking back on that, are there any things that you wish you'd done differently when you presented that business case? I think one thing that we sort of found out when we're going through the business case, and this is possibly more on the sort of the, the more sort of tangible financial benefits, is we had we had to make decisions. You know, things overran costs increased we had to introduce new scope to to ensure that we delivered the program in the way we wanted to so we were reactive on on how how we adjust the business case accordingly so for example if costs go up you really want your benefits to go up so you're still making your return but we we're all sort of a little bit reactive in that now what we could have done at the outset is said like what are all the sort of scenarios and if costs go up if there's an overrun by six months how can we we might have to do that overrun but how do we actually sort of mitigate that from a, a returns perspective so that's what we did in the program we were continually re re-looking at our benefits and and understanding how we can get more more out of the program but it was a bit reactive it would have been better to have that all mapped out up up front and having all those levers there in place and you mentioned the financial aspect, because of course, like our, our conversation so far has very much been about the risk aspect. So talk to me about how you went about assessing the financial benefits of the programme. So the two main financial areas, one was the total cost of ownership of our IT systems. And then the other area was, well, main, mainly sort of headcount and our people cost. So moving from a sort of non-standard a uh, suboptimal organizational structure legacy systems you can imagine the level of manual processes and duplication reworking things like that so there was a real opportunity to um, reduce headcount uh, in the end it was about a third of the finance department i mean it was size wow. the finance department was about four thousand people so wow. a massive reduction so the first thing was external benchmarking. So I worked work with external benchmarking to understand where BT was on the scale against its peers and understand then which process areas BT is versus peers. So is it all in the planning side? Is it on the, you know, the general ledger? Is it on the project accounting? So just understanding there. And then we could actually look at the current makeup of bt finance by process area and then say right well these this area needs to improve by 20 percent. this one 40 this one's okay and set a target accordingly so it was actually came from sort of a re realistic science and evaluation and was that an external consultancy that you guys brought in did you have like published research that you used to sort of set the initial benchmarks how did you approach it we didn't have that data in house, so we had to go to an external firm, a specialist benchmarking firm, who did an assessment and it looked at every single role in the four thousand roles, uh, understood which process they fell under, and then provided the analysis to compare that to a sort of best in class, you know, and the top quartile. So we were looking at going for top quartile. We were not 
you know, realistically best in class. Um, we were probably third quartile or something. So we, we put a realistic gap of what we needed to get to um, at the end of the program. And so that was obviously, how did you approach it in terms of, did you set the, because it sounds like you guys, when it came to like the people side, set the benchmark and then you went away and figured out how, or did you do it the other way around? Did you actually assess what was realistic for your organization and then compare that against the benchmark to put the business case forwards? It was a little bit of both, but I would say it's primarily bottom up. So actually looking at where we are against the market and, and our peers and then building a case from that to justify what what we can achieve so so and and that was almost like a spreadsheet exercise and then it was the hard bit was actually getting the buy-in and getting the the relevant cfos in each of the divisions to say right i'm going to sign up to that massive target that you're putting in front of me <laughs> And and that's yeah, I was going to say because that's the interesting piece. So talk to because obviously we say we talked about obviously there's a financial aspect in terms of people. What about talk talk us about how you approach the total cost of ownership piece? So the total cost of ownership. Uh, so this was all our. Uh, this was the IT side. So this was looking at um, what what it's costing us to run finance so end to end. So it was the platform costs. It was the software costs. It was the hardware. Um, potentially the upgrade costs. So what are we spending? So first of all, it was just trying to gather that information. So if you look at the 150 systems, getting all the information, that was not in one place. So there's a lot of work to actually understand really what are we spending across finance? I think that was the first thing. The other challenges were a lot of our big software contracts with, with our big vendors were um, not just on one function. So they're across HR, they're across other Function. So how do you how do you apportion that to say how much is actually finance and how much is not finance? That was the other challenge. And then the, the third problem was we're trying to compare business case for doing the, this investment or not. And the do, not doing it is what we're calling our do nothing case. So what assumptions do you make to say I'm going to do nothing? So for example, we know we upgrade systems periodically, but in my do nothing case, what am I going to assume for upgrading systems? Am I going to assume, look, that's too complicated or am I going to put a case together? And that that was tricky. And so, I mean, you know, we, we looked at what we thought we were going to upgrade in 10 years. We thought it would be 20 million just in finance systems, even if we didn't do finance transformation. Um, finance yeah. transformation was over two, 200 million. It was the hundreds of millions. So it was massive. So. But do you put that in your business case? Because that's quite a big number to sort of include in your cash flow or not. And at the <laughs> end, you know, so, you know. And, and that's really interesting. So, so part of your business case was the, was obviously putting together this, this do nothing scenario. So if we did nothing, this is what we're going to spend anyway. Was there, did you almost put together different options as part of the business case, like a best case and a worst case as well for each of the areas that you were focusing on? Yes, we did. So we, we had a base case, which we did most of the work around. I mean, one thing, key thing we did is that we hadn't, when we did the original business case, we hadn't actually selected a supplier. And we thought that different suppliers would actually generate different levels of return. So some would drive more simplification in the processes and we could drive out more heads, for example. So we ran to actually, when we went to the board initially, we had two almost like two mini business, business cases, two scenarios. And we said, can you sign them both off? Because we haven't made a decision on the, on the software yet. <laughs> so there was definitely that. And then, yes, we're running, we're running these scenarios, you know, the normal sort of 10% more, 10% less. I think probably the biggest thing was just making sure that we quantified the big, in the risks and opportunities, the big swing items, and making sure that those are covered or we've got the mitigations to cover it. But, yeah. So what do you mean by that? For those perhaps that don't quite understand, when you say big swing, do you mean like um, bigger costs or costs that might escalate during project? Or do you yeah. mean? Yeah. 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 So, so main, mainly around the project. So if, for example, the project overruns by six months, what is the additional cost are going to be incurred? And, and also what's the delay in the benefits? So you get a sort of double hit. And, and understanding that variability was useful to sort of uh, give, give confidence that we could deliver a return on the program. 
and obviously you're doing this business case without necessarily knowing the supplier at this stage um, and and also perhaps how far in the like the scope of the the change had you actually got did you sort of go in with an initial top level business case to say this is this is where this is the value we think we can bring and then did you bring that back once you made some firmer decisions around processes around technology and people at that stage or was it kind of a you were given that remit to work with them I, th- I think it was a bit more developed than that and i know that previous programs we have have sort of done that almost like saying well this is the market this is what we think we can do i think we were a bit more developed so we had a a high level phased rollout plan uh, so which we knew that you know the different stages uh, over the time we had a time period of when we're going to roll out um, we knew our key stakeholders who would be involved and the key sort of customers we had all our process mapped out and um, we had so we had a lot, there's a lot, obviously a lot not done, but there was not enough to give us some, you know, some, some credibility in, in what we're putting forward. However, uh, this, this was the biggest finance transformation program in Europe by the, the supply we went with in the end. So it was absolutely wow. huge. And we had nobody in the world we could properly benchmark our costs with upfront. So it's extremely mm-hmm. difficult to gauge how much you're going to spend on on a program this scale i can imagine and 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 do you like how far like looking back now because like it's always great looking looking in retrospect isn't it you you sort of think like how close were you in terms of costs was it did you were you in the ballpark or did did it go a lot further in terms of costing expected I, i think there's different stories behind this so you know, when you when you look at the cold light of day, you could say actually we we weren't too bad. We we were reasonably close. But I think what we didn't consider were some of the other items that we had to do as part of the program to be able to deliver it. And that was a real swing item. So in particular, our legacy systems, it wasn't just a question of just swapping them out with some new systems. It was all the years and decades of data that we held, all our balances. And we had to spend, I'm no kidding, probably a year plus just doing mock reconciliations every month end, almost like parallel running, but it was just understanding until we got our data right. And that was very time consuming and extremely costing, costly. I mean, it really was. And that was the one thing that I'd recommend if, you, if you're ever doing a big legacy company with that level at 20 billion of finance um being around for decades lots of systems don't underestimate getting that legacy getting your data right from day one and that's what we probably should have done we should have not started the project and just spent a year just getting that data right i often have this conversation so obviously not quite on the same scale as you because a lot of the ones we're working with are sort of mid-sized businesses but i often have that conversation with people about almost you want you're better off having less data, but cleaner data going into a new system. Mm. And, and, and there is the, yeah. certainly with this, there is a tendency to say, no, no, I want to bring everything across. And, and if you've got different data structures, you've got different ways of using that data, then that's not always realistic. Um, and like you say, you can, you can spend a considerable amount of money and time just trying to get data mm. moved. Yeah, and actually right. there is this there are some instances where you have to say like is there a different way to approach the historical mm. data yeah no, i think you're right and it's, it's really interesting to see like again you know and to be fair i think you you were on a different scale with 150 systems like you you know that's that's in a completely different need mm. but it is mm. it is interesting and i also think it's something that smaller projects as well don't think about they don't think about the, the cleanliness of their data but also they mm. think about like the historical piece and what it's going to take to 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 get yeah. that into yeah. into a good format. So what so what other lessons did you learn? So that that impacted costs that you hadn't thought about perhaps at that early business um, case so, stage. So I think you know we 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 did a, originally a five year plan on our project. That was a five year rollout and. We had a benefits case and it was, let's say, marginal. It was to getting a return, but a smallish return because, as I said, most of the benefits were around risk reduction and, and those sort of things. But there was a real drive to get this in 
quicker. So there was a top down pressure to relook at our plan and see if we could get it down to a three and a half year rollout. Mm. so which is quite sizable so the program was built up into phases so we had for example general ledger was one of our big phases swapping that out and then there was the sub ledgers you know a subsequent phase and then we had international as a, a third phase so we tried to sort of effectively sort of par parallel over so rather than having them more sequentially doing the phases, we sort of started phase two without finishing phase one and we rebuilt it into a plan which on paper sounded possible and it was possible but you end up with quite a lot of inefficiencies running two phases on the same program team be getting people in one meeting saying well i'm in a phase two meeting but i need to be in a phase one or it was literally a resourcing constraint and the business focus was what are we delivering our customers are saying well you're doing phase one you're doing phase two what am i getting next it, so it's quite difficult to sort of get that sort of change management that engagement communication i mean just all those knock-on effects meant that we ended up just saying, hold on, we hold our hands, we just, this, this, this can't be the right way of doing it. And we went back to a five-year plan and we probably wasted, we did waste a lot of time and money again, trying to start a phase too early when we should have just waited and just done it sequentially. Yeah, and it's really interesting to talk about phasing. I talk about this a lot, again, with customers because there, there is a tendency people want to jump in with two feet and, and do everything at mm. once. And you've kind of got to have those, those, some, those sometimes difficult conversations yeah. to say, let's be realistic. Now, in terms of how you manage, because obviously you're, even though you're swapping into new systems, you still need to have that interconnectedness between existing systems. So how did you decide what to phase and you know what to prioritize as you went through that process? And, and you know, did you account in for things like the cost to keep those into, you know, to build new integrations to, to support the swap out of those systems yeah. and things like that? Yeah. Was there any costs like that that came up? There, there were. I mean, we we tried we tried to build a plan with a sort of the smallest sort of interim operating models so that we could, you know, avoid that. I mean, one of the hardest ones was internal trading and 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 that's massive at BT. I mean, something like more than the total revenue of the company is internally traded. So wow. it doesn't actually go. So when it's all consolidated as, a, as an organization, you don't see it, it just disappears. But so, so, and I actually worked as part of my role as a global process owner for a while on that. And we spent probably, more time working out an interim operating model and actually the final model you know how over a year are we going to manage when some ledgers are going to be on an old system and someone on new and it just got you know it gave you a headache just trying to work it out with spaghetti maps and things so yes there was a cost when we built that in but we tried to minimize as much as we could because it's very very costly high risk and you're going to ultimately throw it away that is, there's no asset yeah. created no there's no value in that piece of work mm. is there because it's it all comes from uh the, sort of getting to the end goal so were there yeah. any other learnings now you're reflecting on uh this process that you you know things that you wish you'd known or thought about early on in the, the business case i think another area was a scope so um this is more really, I, I guess what well, it was more around the requirements i guess so it was it's always a way you put a set of requirements, you try and define what you're trying to build. And then you, um, when you, when you sort of get further down the line in the design, or even when you've gone live, you end up, it's not quite right. But what we did is we sort of built a set of requirements over time, different areas of the program were building the requirements. And we got to a point where we've just felt that this wasn't fully joined up and is this really reflecting. So we did a bit of a reset and I, I pulled together a sort of an end to end I call it high level, it was about 150 page requirements document, which was, you know, le level three or something. It was not down in the depths, but it was still quite comprehensive. And we just sent that back out to our customers, so all the key people in the finance. And we said, look, this is what we're planning to do. Give us your feedback. And I just created this database of feedback and we had to pick one by one to try and just align it all to make sure that we all had it nailed down. We knew we were going to d deliver what they wanted, what they expected. And we just reformed that and got a re really good set of requirements. It took a long time, a lot of work, but we ended up just resetting it all 
which I think would have saved a lot of time and money later on the line if we hadn't got that alignment at that point. Yeah, no, that I, I think there is something for for I call, I call it the boots on the ground for you, right? Actually, getting what because it all things always sound great in theory, but until you put it in front of the people that are experiencing the challenges right now or doing the job, you don't always get the 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 intricacies of what you're thinking. Yeah, so that, yeah. Yeah, I think I think you would have saved a lot of money you didn't even realise, and that's the worst thing, yeah, isn't it, when you I, do those things? <laughs> yeah, you don't see the benefit. Yeah, no. that's the hard thing. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's you can probably never spend as much time just getting that nailing down those requirements. You, you're always going to save the money and the time. Uh, and obviously, as you've gone through this process, right, this is like how long did, let's just talk about the business case piece, right? How long did actually putting the business case together take you? The business case took, it was probably maybe six months, four, four to six months. I, I look back later on uh, in my files and I'd done 200 iterations of the business case. So that's how wow. much toing and froing there was. <laughs> both in the Word document and in the Excel supporting files. So it was very, very onerous exercise. I mean, let's go through lots of sets of boards. So the BT governance was you go through one set of boards, it's like a sort of operational sort of CapEx board. Then you had to go through a sort of sort of a, a executive board, which is the sort of the non-executive directors essentially of BT. And then you have to go to the main BT board because of the level of cost involved. So there was a lot of generation each time it goes to a board. It's a different format of paper. It's different people have to be um, briefed and upward briefed in their team. So there's a huge, and I sort of project manage that sort of that whole process of, of getting an ultimate board approval from having a blank sheet of paper. And so, you know, scheduling all the meetings, working with all the different secretaries for different boards and who's going to be on it and who needs to brief who. And, you know, that was a project in its own right. <laughs> it sounds it to be very fair. And and, yeah. in, and in terms of how you sort of presented, were there any particular tips and tricks for those? Because I think sometimes it's not just about how you put the business case together in terms of the numbers and the detail that sits in it. In a lot of cases, it's how you present it and how people understand the business mm -hmm. case that you're putting forward. So what did you help do to help sort of help the the boards themselves be able to sort of understand sort of the, the detail that sits in that business case? So I think it was a lot of sort of upward briefing by the different areas. So for example, in IT, it was making sure that the IT directors would be able to brief the the the, the the technology chief executive so it was is it was, it was making sure that that framework was in place i think one tip for me and i've used it in other business cases when i worked on the hr transformation is being really thoroughly prepared and having all your backup so that if the finance director you know group finance director says well what is it versus the outlook or what is it versus the, the forecast that we did last month or what is it against the annual strategic plan or, you know, what um, what's the view versus CapEx versus OPEX expenditure? You know, everything's covered. And, you know, I've been in a situation where I literally did have it and it was just a lifesaver because otherwise you can get torn apart because oh, I don't understand or so definitely the preparation is key. Preparation, that's you've got to know your numbers inside and out mm. is, is what we're saying here. Yeah. And, and the other question I guess I had for you is because you talked about there was a bit of an about turn because this obviously you went through this business case and then I'm getting you went into the planning phase and then as you were going through the project was that when the you know you became aware of the the impact of cloud computing and whether you might need to look at some alternative ways mm -hmm. to to actually deploy the, the yeah. changes that you put the business case for yeah yeah so I and mean, the, the the cloud computing was you know as you, as, you, as you, I guess, know, is that obviously now that's almost pretty much everyone's going in there. But I guess 10 years ago, an ERP system or a finance transformation, not that wasn't big on the table. So it was that was quite a big decision. And you know, it wasn't my personal decision or anything, but it was a decision made by the technology teams. We can't be going down an on-premise system. We've got to think 
cloud. It's got all the benefits of sta a standard, um, sta a standard best practice way of doing finance and running finance systems. So that's got to be great. It's got obviously the lower cost of you know not hosting and and, that, and the, the platform costs etc. So there were many many benefits of going down there, but it was a a huge cost i suppose because we'd gone down one route for quite a few years and then we almost had to say well that was actually not the right route to take and we've now got to go down another route but it's still best for the and, business to do that and did you then have to do like a, a reassessment of the business case including both the loss cost from the sort of the first wave and you know almost figuring yeah. out what you could rescue yeah. from that yeah the first yeah. couple of phases and then run that against the the new revised costs yes yes so it wasn't really just a start again business case um but it was obviously you've got a lot of assets sitting there um what do you do with them uh so that was mm. one is assessment going through all the what you've capitalized and understanding what can be reused what can't be reused then having to have the conversations well what do you do on do you accelerate the depreciation um there's so that there's some difficult sort of conversations but you know that, that's technology it's it's ultimately it's good Moves. you know good technology <laughs> Yeah, and and I think that's the challenge, you know, with a lot of tech, with because te the pace of technology is just accelerating, and right. you know, AI is obviously driving a lot of that change right now. And if you're, it, sometimes it's really hard to you know, actually do a stop pause and reassess, even though you've made decisions like two or three years ago. You know, yeah. you've, you're in a different space, and right. and it's really hard. Like I find it really hard having those conversations when, so we're always trying to future proof everything that. We recommend uh, but you just can't i was just thinking i mean one thing was was looking back and we didn't do and i'm thinking i wonder what your take is, is on it is sort of sustainability reporting and esg yeah. reporting that was just something that didn't go in there i'm just so looking back thinking i'm amazed were we just slightly too went in there slightly too late too early and it has not there i mean do you see it now coming a big thing i mean is that going to become part of our standard cloud packages and yeah What's worrying me right now, and this is my personal view, is that there's not enough focus on the need for sustainability reporting because there is mm. so much work You're going right. on behind the scenes right now in terms of standards. Um, mm. And I don't think, I think there's work being, I think things are happening at the moment around technology. And, and I've seen some really interesting proofs of concepts around reporting, but I don't it's what, what I think the bit that worries me is that people aren't asking for it in their requirements right now as much as they should be, mm, because yeah. it is going to hit us literally in the next, yeah. I would say, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, um, we're going to start seeing it. changing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I so think. I think, and so what I suspect is going to happen, and I, I will get my crystal ball out, is that all of that's going to be done on spreadsheets. Right. And then there's going to be, you know, like when MTD came along, there's going to be a massive 12 month period where everyone has to shift on to digital sustainability reporting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I I think personally, I think that's what will happen is that, you know, it's like anything standards dry. It's why it's so important to have it in standards, but standards drive requirements in a lot of cases. So, yeah. you know, as, as they become more commonplace and obviously it's starting in the the, the more enterprise level organizations, but that will roll really quickly through to the smaller business, the smaller mm. medium sized businesses, because they'll have yeah. to in order for those larger businesses to comply. So, yeah. so yeah, right. so it is, it is interesting. Um, I think you've got, I think if you were doing this five to what, five years, five to 10 years ago, was it that you actually kicked off the requirements piece? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I would be, I think anyone now, certainly at the enterprise level, that isn't thinking about sustainability reporting needs to add it into their to-do yeah, list because right. it's a no-brainer. And then I think yeah. mid-size, it will be in the next 18 months that they will, I will start to see that coming through, I hope, mm. uh, based on yeah. what I've heard about the timeframes around that reporting. Mm. Yeah. So that's one so, <laughs> But I, I think there is this piece for me about transformation is a journey it's not a destination so and as much as you like i think there's a there is it sounds like you've done some great due diligence around your requirements
pants and doing that sense check at a boots on a ground level piece is really is is great because I think a lot of people miss that especially in larger transformation projects but I also think that it it's that agility is that's why agility is so important in finance transformation because as you go through you need to be able to adapt and change and and it, mm. but I guess the challenge with a large organization is like you have to then reassess doesn't, the business agile doesn't the, always the work as easy yeah yeah <laughs> So I do think in some ways, I feel like medium-sized businesses do have a bit of an advantage sometimes with finance transformation yeah. in that one, right. they can react and, and predict and move a bit faster. But mm. secondly, they have maybe more budget than those smaller organizations that mm. don't have the money to and see the value. Because I think there is a point where I think certainly enterprise and medium, there is real value in finance transformation because you get, you know, all the additional benefits. You don't always see it at the smaller end, which is interesting. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. So, so one thing I wanted to ask you about then is that you, you talked a lot about obviously creating the business case, but what kind of reflections and assessments did you do like after you started implementing the phases to kind of benchmark yourself about what, what you planned? You know, what was the sort of the review process as you went through the projects? So we had a formal quarterly review where it would go up to the the board. And so I had to essentially re redo the number. So update with our, our latest forecasts and our latest benefits forecasts and build a like a sort of update on the case, you know, a new MPV as it were. And that was a fairly light touch process. So, it, but it had to go through and it was formally documented. We, we had to externally um, announce what our savings were on the program because we, it was a, it was a, it was a communicated externally program, part of our annual accounts, part of a, a wider cost reduction. So there was, it had to be auditable. So that was an annual review. And then there were probably three other revisits, sort of full business case revisits to the board during the program where I, where it was a lot more thorough. So we were literally resetting. It was normally as a result of a material change to the scope or a material change to the, the costs. So one, one example was when we, um, the legacy costs and all getting our data uh, in order that was a material cost to the program and a material delay to the program we put that in and we justified that by essentially setting more challenges to the units that they could make more savings and more people savings we introduced a benefit of offshoring so we moved staff offshore which was the right um, operating model anyway for for finance but obviously it was a lot lower cost and then we um, revisited some of our sort of do nothing assumptions because some of them actually in hindsight our assumptions were probably a bit too pessimistic and we we realized that actually we, we did save more money than we thought and they were legitimately included in our business case so we could justify it and still bring a, a turnaround but we had to do you know it was all at arm's length and we had to actually show that we were delivering the program fantastic now, Chris, I literally could just keep asking you questions about this. I, I feel like I do need to maybe look in a, in a few months about a bit of a follow up into some of the questions I haven't got around to. But for anyone that is um, thinking about going through finance transformation, whether they're a small, a medium or a large organization, you know, what are your top tips around building that business case? What are the things that they need to think about before they even start dipping their toe into the finance transformation water to make sure that they really understand, you know, how to deliver value for their organization? I think it's key to understand sort of what, what, what's the rationale? Why, why are you doing this program or this transformation? You know, really what's the driver of it? I think it's understanding the appetite and where you are on the journey of the buy-in at a senior level, which is which is absolutely critical. And then it is it's, it's understanding where you are in, in in your peers. So where are you as an organization? Are you trying to do something actually you're pretty good already and it's only a smaller change, or is it something that you're really in a bad way and really there's a lot more opportunity? So I think those are the key things that if you get those in place, that's really going to help. 
Amazing, amazing. And and obviously, if people, you know, want to learn more about yourself, Chris, um, and, you know, hear more about your journey and your work in finance transformation, where is the best place to sort of to find you? So I'm on LinkedIn, Chris Lloyd Mostyn, if you type that in, there aren't that many Chris Lloyd Mostyn, so you probably will find me. <laughs> and um, I think in the show notes, that link will be in there as well. Uh, also, I'm doing a a slot at the uh, World Finance Forum on the 5th of September um, on finance transformation, maximizing return on investment. So if you're interested in attending that, the link is also in the show notes. Um, but happy if you want to message me or connect with me on LinkedIn, happy if you want any questions or any advice on my experience, 10 years in transformation, more than happy to help. Thank you so much, Chris. And yeah, you know, guys, as always, would love your feedback. If there's questions you feel we should have asked, because again, rapidly ran out of time um, and some great content here from Chris to, to help. And obviously that experience around putting together that business case is so invaluable. So please do reach out to me if you've got any further questions. Obviously reach out to Chris. And as he said, all of the links will be in the show notes. And if you have enjoyed this podcast, which I'm sure you will have, then please do leave us a review. It's how we know, you know we're doing a good job and it's a great way to share success with our presenters as well. So thank you so much, Chris, for joining me on the show. Yeah, and so, yeah, much. hopefully we'll really have, enjoyed you, it. have you on again soon. Yeah, that's no, brilliant. Thanks very much. That's really, really great. Thank you.